Okay, uh, we're still talking about various types of waves in plasmas. And last time we had uh, derived basically a, um, a dispersion relation, a general electromagnetic dispersion relation, and started talking about some particular uh, uh, limits of it. So let's go back to that. So it's, the word is sort of electromagnetic um, um, wave dispersion relation. And what it really comes in is in the form of a set of, um, well, three equations in a matrix form operating on the electric field. So the idea was it was a K squared identity tensor um, minus uh, omega squared over C squared times the dielectric tensor minus K vector, K vector, all dotted into E tilde, which is then the vector E X, E Y, E Z is equal to zero. And then for this, we had to have uh, that the dielectric tensor epsilon was equal to the permeability of free space with an identity tensor. Identity tensor is, of course, just 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, or it's x hat, x hat, plus y hat, y hat, plus z hat, z hat, if I wanted to really write out a tensor. And then we also had, uh, for the dielectric constant, the response of the plasma of a magnetized plasma in the cold plasma limit was the sum over species of the plasma frequency of each species squared divided by omega squared. And then there was a, a big matrix here, which was omega squared over omega squared minus omega c j squared. And then i omega um, omega sub c over omega squared minus omega c <coughs> j squared. And 0. And then uh, minus i omega omega sub c j divided by omega squared minus omega c j squared, 0, and then omega squared over omega squared minus omega c j squared. This is just repeating, so hopefully we've got it down before. Uh, and 0, 0, and then just a 1 down there. And then I need to close all the parentheses. So the idea uh, is that we have this um, dispersion relation in general, electromagnetic wave dispersion relation, and here's the plasma dielectric constant. Uh, the one, again, um, represents uh, vacuum. So this is vacuum, or the identity tensor, and this other part is the plasma response. Now, what we want to do today is mostly uh, just talk about a few limits, a few particular limits of this dispersion relation, and uh, therefore kind of illuminate what, uh, what goes on. Now, the way we choose some particular limits is that, in general, this says for any arbitrary direction of electric field, magnetic field, and k-vector. And so the way we choose some limiting cases is to choose some particular directions, you know, in the direction of k, k in the same direction as b or perpendicular to an electric field in the same direction as b or, or whatever. And also by convention, perhaps I should remind you that our magnetic field is always in the z hat or in the z direction, okay? That's an implicit uh, thing as we go along. So let's talk about some particular cases. Now, the sort of simplest case that we can talk about is electron plasma oscillations perpendicular to B. So let's talk about electron or electrostatic, sorry. Um, electron oscillations perpendicular to the equilibrium magnetic field. Now, uh, electrostatic means what? Well, it means that curl of E is zero, 
E is derivable from a, a scalar, from the gradient of a scalar potential. But what it really means for us is that K cross E tilde is equal to zero. Therefore, what it means is that the K vector is parallel to the electric field perturbation vector. Now, both K, so K and E are going to be in the same direction, but both are going to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. Now, our general coordinate system here is that we have, you know, the Z direction is our magnetic field here. And so we have an X and a Y. And then it's somewhat, our, so any direction perpendicular is the direction we can take both K and E. And for simplicity, it, you know, you can take it any direction perpendicular, but we choose it to be in the X direction. So we'll take K hat or K vector and the electric field to be in the X direction for, you know, a particular case. So choose is what we want to say. K vector is equal to K z hat. I'm sorry, x hat. Works so hard to get it in the x direction. And then the electric field uh, perturbation is only an x perturbation in the x direction. Now how do we then extract from this general dispersion relation here, or dispersion tensor, just the part that would be applicable for a wave propagating in the x direction perpendicular to b? Well, first what we do is we plug in that E is equal to E tilde x hat. And in matrix form, what that would be is, of course, just E tilde, E x tilde, E y tilde is equal to 0. And E z tilde is equal to 0. So it's just E x tilde 0, 0. But that would just help us on part of it. So what we really end up doing is you take the x hat component of the dispersion relation, and then, then it's dotted into e x tilde x hat is equal to 0. So if you uh, put all that together, what you then uh, end up doing, and now looking back to this dispersion relation, so x hat, remember the identity tensor was just equal to x hat, x hat, plus y hat, y hat, plus z hat, z hat. So if I take unit vectors in the x direction and dot it in on both sides, then this k squared i, so the dot, dot, dot is supposed to be this whole dispersion relation here. Dispersion tensor, actually, is what it's called. Uh, so first what we get is a k squared times 1, because x hat, x hat. And then we get a minus omega squared over c squared times epsilon hat x x. Remember, the hat here means that the dielectric tensor is not in the limit omega goes to zero, it's in response to a wave. So it's a finite frequency um, dielectric constant. And then minus k vector, k vector, but that will just be k squared because k is equal, in, equal to kx, actually. So this would be minus kx squared, but kx squared is k. And so that's zero. So those two parts uh, cancel out. And what our... Um, dispersion relation then becomes is, uh, well, we can, well, leave the omega squared. So it becomes omega squared over c squared epsilon hat xx, that is to say the 1, 1 component, is equal to 0. And so this is omega squared over c squared. And now we need to go back and figure out from this whole dielectric tensor what the xx component was. And um, we can see that it's going to be 1 minus omega p squared, uh, and the two omega squared cancel out, and we get omega squared minus omega c squared. So it's going to be then uh, epsilon naught times 1 minus the sum over species of omega p j squared divided by frequency squared minus cyclotron frequency squared. Now, one further uh, nuance on this is that uh, we use the word electron plasma os or oscillations, electrostatic electrons. So what that says is that instead of just J being electrons and ions, we'll only do it for electrons. Now, the, there's two solutions to this 
dispersion relation then. One is omega equals zero. That's the uninteresting one. The other one is where the thing in brackets goes to zero. And so writing that out, again, I guess I need to go one step further here. It's omega squared over c squared epsilon naught. And then uh, this becomes omega squared, well, sorry, 1 minus omega p e squared over frequency squared minus electron cyclotron frequency squared. And if we set that equal to zero, as we, we want to here, okay, then you can just uh, see that you get two sets of solutions. The omega squared is not the interesting one. And so the d dispersion relation we're interested in is that omega is equal to omega p e squared plus omega c e squared. And how does this differ from what we had for electrostatic plasma oscillations or electrostatic electron oscillations along the field line? Well, along the field line, we didn't have any cyclotron frequency. So all this says is that you get frequency is equal to the electron plasma frequency, but if you have a magnetic field and you're propagating perpendicular to it, then it's the sum of the squares of the electron uh, plasma frequency and cyclotron frequency. And this is usually referred to in the business as the upper hybrid frequency, if I take the square root, of course. So this says that electrostatic plasma oscillations moving perpendicular to the field are affected by the magnetic field. And they uh, then um, get the electron plasma frequency. Okay, the next one we need to do is the similar thing, uh, but for ions. So the next thing we want to do um, is electrostatic ion oscillations perpendicular to the magnetic field. Again, electrostatic means K cross E <coughs> tilde is equal to zero. Uh, therefore, K is parallel to the electric field perturbation. And again, we choose uh, K is equal to K X hat. Um, and the electric field is chosen to be in the EX tilde uh, X hat direction. And what we found um, was this will work the same now uh, as before was um, what, we actually, what we found was that um, all we needed to do was, um, was set epsilon XX. I'm sorry, don't want to do that. Um, epsilon xx hat equals zero. That's what we ended up doing. And previously, we specialized to only electrons. So now what we want to do is specialize to putting in also ions. So it becomes 1 minus omega pe squared over frequency squared minus electron cyclotron frequency squared. And then add also the effect due to the, the plasma response due to the ions, the response in the plasma due to the ions, omega pi squared over frequency squared minus ion cyclotron frequency squared. Now, uh, this is a, a little bit uh, sort of a complicated dispersion relation. Uh, question is, you know, can we deal with some reasonable sorts of cases? Um, the first is, uh, Suppose we were interested uh, in frequencies near the ion cyclotron frequency, omega ci. Then what we would have happen is that this term here would be pretty well dominant, okay? And I and this term could not be important because there'd be a resonance there, you know. And so I'd just equate those two terms. And uh, if you do that you then find that, roughly speaking, what you get is that omega is approximately omega ci. And then, truthfully, you also get some, uh, if you do it right and, and in detail, 
you get some thermal corrections, k squared, actually k, kz squared, v thermal squared, thermal corrections. But we sort of won't worry about that. But the um, main thing we'd like to do uh, is to actually go into a sort of intermediate regime. First question is, how big is the electron plasma frequency compared to the ion plasma frequency? Well, the electron plasma frequency squared is 1 over the electron mass, and the ion plasma frequency is 1 over the ion mass. So therefore, uh, if we actually look at omega p i squared and then over omega c i squared, it turns out that's much greater than, by the mass ratio, omega p e squared over omega c e squared. We've worked out these mass ratios before. So the interesting case, uh, uh, let's, so let's say note, so then what we want to do is consider the case or an intermediate frequency regime, which is not close, which is much higher than the ion cyclotron frequency, but in turn is much less than the electron cyclotron frequency. And this is going to be what's called a hybrid or intermediate frequency. Now, if the frequency is high compared to the ion cyclotron frequency, then we can more or less neglect the ion cyclotron frequency in there. And if the frequency is low compared to the electron cyclotron frequency, we can neglect the, the, um, cyclo the uh, frequency squared in there. So what our dispersion relation becomes then is 0 is equal to 1, epsilon naught's a constant, so we don't need to worry about it, minus, and now let me put omega pi squared over omega I squared, so that's the ion response, and then the electron electron response is omega pe squared actually plus over omega ce squared. And so if we put these together, what you can see is that we'll get, um, well, we take this over to the other side and then divide out, and what you're going to get is omega squared is equal to omega pi squared divided by 1 plus omega pe squared over omega ce squared. Now, um, so uh, people usually write this. I'll write this out on the next line, same thing, actually, is equal to omega pi squared divided by 1 plus omega pe squared over omega ce squared. Um, and in this form, what we would call it is an ion plasma frequency oscillation. On the other hand, if I make the approximation, and the approximation used here is that, in fact, in the denominator, the plasma response part is more important than the one, which was the vacuum dielectric response. So specifically, omega pe squared is much greater than omega ce squared. Then this becomes omega pi squared over omega p e squared, and then omega c e squared. But this is equal to the electron to ion mass ratio, a small number. And then if we remember that the electron cyclotron frequency is qb over m, we can just convert, and this becomes the absolute value because some people put signs on these things, omega c e times omega c i, where we have used the fact that uh, omega c i is equal to m e over m i times omega c i. That is to say the electron cyclotron, the ion cyclotron, sorry, the ion cyclotron frequency is the in small mass ratio times the electron cyclotron frequency. Now, in this form, or this particular limit, um, this is called the lower hybrid frequency. Hmm. That one's not working very well. None of my yellows are working very well. I'll start out with that. 
Okay. Now, how was that different from the upper hybrid frequency? Well, let's remind ourselves the upper hybrid frequency was something greater than the electron plasma frequency, whereas this is an intermediate between the electron and ion cyclotron frequencies. Okay. Now, so that's sort of two special cases. Uh, we now want to go on to another uh, special case. And now we'll move into general electromagnetic waves. And the particular case that we want to deal with um, is called the ordinary wave. Now, we'll have to remind ourselves what we mean by the word ordinary wave. An ordinary wave was such that the electric field perturbation was parallel to the equilibrium magnetic field. That's what we may, meant by ordinary wave. And then we'll choose also, uh, but then, uh, and I should say also, um, we'll choose that um, K is perpendicular to B naught. So we're looking for an ordinary wave uh, propagating, meaning in the K direction, perpendicular to B naught. So we may need a little uh, diagram to keep all this straight. So let's uh, try one here. Uh, and this one's out of Chen, so he has his directions goofed up relative to my usual way of doing things. Uh, namely, this is Chen's diagram uh, 4-33, and he puts the z-axis up there, and that's then the magnetic field direction. Uh, y direction is here, and uh, the x direction is here. So we have to then have that the magnetic field is certainly in this direction, so B naught is in that direction, but also we want the electric field in that direction. Okay. But uh, but then I want this mode to propagate some other direction, um, and so I'll choose the k-vector to be in this direction. So it's propagating perpendicular to the magnetic field, but with an electric field component along the magnetic field. Um, I'll come back and do the other. There's another case in a moment here, but this will do us for a moment. Um, so what we want to do then is we'll choose that the k-vector is going to be in the uh, x-direction and the electric field is in the z-direction. Um, now, if you then go back to our whole tensor uh, where we had k-vector, k-vector, you will and kx is k then, you'll just get k squared, x hat, x hat, and so we'll only get the 1, 1 component. Um, now, what you, however, have to do for this dispersion relation uh, is that it's now things in the z direction. B naught, remember, is always in the z direction. So if we come back, maybe I should write or bring back what our dispersion relation is here, this thing, um, we'll get a k squared certainly there, but since we're interested in the z component, it's basically what we end up doing is take z hat dot all this stuff dot e um, and set that equal to zero, and e is only in the z direction. So what you can see we'll get is basically that we'll get k squared minus, so we'll just get a k squared identity tensor will give us a zz, oops, sorry, identity tensor will give us a zz component. Then we'll get omega squared over c squared, and then epsilon zz, and then um, minus k vector, k vector. But that's x hat, x hat, and if we just take the z components of it, that's actually zero. So we don't need to care about that. And um, the only other thing we need to know is that our dielectric constant 
in the case of the ZZ component, that's the along the field component, is actually the standard plasma dielectric constant in the absence of a magnetic field, namely 1 minus omega p squared over omega squared. So if we uh, put all that together, so this just becomes 1 minus omega p e squared plus omega p i squared over omega squared, but the ion plasma frequency is much less than the electron plasma frequency, so we'll just, you know, neglect this is of order Me over Mi, and so we'll set that equal to zero for uh, simplicity. And so then our dispersion relation just becomes k squared uh, minus then omega squared over c squared, and then minus omega p e squared over c squared, and that's all equal to zero. Um, or if we change this into an omega squared equals various things, it's then omega squared is equal to omega p e squared plus c squared k squared. Now, have we had that dispersion relation before? The answer is yes. Namely, when we were asking about electrostatic, or I'm sorry, electromagnetic oscillations in the absence of a magnetic field, we also had this same dispersion relation. And that's one of the tremendously fortunate things having to do with uh, using microwave interferometers. So the idea is, suppose I have... Uh, uh, a magnetized plasma here. And I got a cylinder of plasma and I put microwaves on. And I, you know, I try to propagate a, a microwave through the plasma and into the, into the microwave horn on the other side. If I have a magnetic field here, then for this particular polarity of wave, namely as I launch the wave, it, it has a k vector across the field, okay, which is what I had up here. But as long as I arrange it so that the electric field vector is also coming out of the board or going into the board, parallel, anti-parallel, either one is okay, I'll get the same dispersion relation, hence the same number of fringe shifts in the microwaves and so forth, or phase shift in the microwaves and going through the plasma, whether I had a magnetic field there or not. So in other words, it doesn't depend upon the presence of the magnetic field. Now that's true for, um, for a, a mode, the so-called ordinary mode, which has the electric field per fluctuation, perturbation, whatever, in the same direction as the magnetic field. On the other hand, if I chose the electric field polarity to be different, so it's propagating in this direction. Electromagnetic wave has to have E and B perpendicular. So if I'd have, um, if I had had it uh, up in this direction, then that would be what's called an extraordinary wave. And it turns out that one does not have this property. So um, the moral to this story is the microwave interferometer which is what the way we measure density, line average density, by the number of fringe shifts because, or number of phase shifts as a wave propagates through compared to the reference wave. Uh, anyway, a microwave interferometer for a meter. I think I had, I got to have on the next line here. Interferometer works with or, or, or in, works independent, let's say, of B naught, just not dependent upon B naught, as long as E is the electric field from the microwaves is parallel to the equilibrium magnetic field. 
And it turns out you have to go through a little bit of algebra, but even though it's maybe not precisely parallel, uh, it's uh, similar even for other directions. So the moral to this story is then that, again, if you want to use a microwave interferometer, you have to arrange that the electric field of the particular um, waves you're launching is in the same direction as the equilibrium magnetic field. Okay, now we want to go on to yet more applications. If we talked about the ordinary mode, next thing up is the extraordinary mode, right? And the extraordinary mode was the same as the ordinary mode, except that it goes in a uh, different direction. And the different direction is that for the extraordinary mode, instead of E and B being in the same direction, they're now supposed to be perpendicular. But they have to, but E tilde also has to be perpendicular to K. So therefore, what you end up doing is doing an E tilde um, perpendicular to B naught, and this is the extra ordinary mode. whereas the red one here was the ordinary mode. So, the uh, diagram's getting a little bollocked up, but anyway. Okay, so now um, the extraordinary wave This, this particular wave will then have K is still perpendicular to B naught, and we're propagating perpendicular to the field line. But now E perp is no longer, well, it's perpendicular to B naught. So now we need to choose some particular directions. And this is a fairly complicated one, so we'll choose in general that it's perpendicular and we know not which direction. So it's E X X tilde plus E Y Y, t y hat. But we'll choose that K is in the direction of X again. Um, it turns out by allowing both E X and E Y in general, it it's going to turn out that this mode is elliptically polarized, perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, that's precisely true if EX and EY are uh, out of phase, but we'll, we'll show that in a moment. Now, um, we'll, for simplicity, consider electrons only. And what specifically we end up doing then is we set... Um, omega pi squared to zero, just uh, for simplicity then. Okay, now um, this one's a little bit more complicated, so I'll write out the whole, more or less the whole dispersion relation. Um, again, we go back to our dispersion tensor, which I'll stick at the top of the graph here. So we have uh, k squared times the identity tensor, but I'll write that out as 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. And then, as usual, we have our minus omega squared over c squared times the uh, dielectric tensor, which I won't write out in detail now. And then we've got k vector, k vector, but in fact, k vector, k vector is just k squared times xx. So that'll just be the 1, 1 component up here. So this k vector, k vector will just become k squared 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And all of this is now times the electric field vector, which for this particular case, extraordinary wave, I should say perpendicular to B naught. Um, it only has EX and EY components, no EZ component. This is equal to uh, 0, 0, 0. Now, because I only have X and Y components,
components. The only parts of this that are, let me say, interesting are, okay, the the two by two part. So it's then, I mean, I could write them all out, but since there's going to be, I'm not going to take any Z component, it's easier not to bother about that part. So if I uh, write those out, um, then the, um, in a matrix form, the 1, 1, or x, x component, so I'm just going to write out a 2 by 2 matrix now, uh, I get a k squared there and a minus k squared there. So in fact, all I get um, is, I'm going to take out a common and minus omega squared over c squared, all I get is epsilon hat x, x for the 1, 1 component. Then for the off-diagonal xy component, I'll just get epsilon hat xy, uh, and likewise epsilon yx, and then I'll get epsilon yy. But now here I have a k squared and I have nothing there. So I will end up with minus k squared. I end up with plus k squared, but I took out a minus omega squared over c squared. So it's k squared c squared over omega squared. And then this is times EX tilde, EY tilde is equal to 0, 0. Okay, now the first thing I want to do is to show you that, in fact, this will lead to an elliptically polarized wave. How would I show that, by the way? Well, to, to show that I had an elliptically polarized wave, what I ought to show you is that EX tilde and EY tilde are out of phase. And how can I get a relationship between EX tilde and EY tilde? Well, i got two of them here. So pick the simplest one, right, which is the, the first row. And so um, let's, uh, so let's call this um, to demonstrate elliptic polarization. And what we need to do is show that EX tilde and EY tilde are out of phase. Um, so let's see. I, I guess I need to write this dispersion relation back. But if I just take the 1-1 the one, one component there, what I'll end up with is EXX hat ex tilde plus epsilon xy hat ey tilde is equal to zero. And this then I can rewrite into ex tilde over ey tilde um, is equal to minus epsilon xy hat divided by epsilon xx hat. Now, we just have to kind of remember what those were. Um, namely, uh, it's minus I omega PE squared uh, omega CE over omega, all divided by omega squared minus omega CE squared. Um, 1 minus omega PE squared divided by frequency squared minus electron cyclotron frequency squared. Now, are those two out of phase? Well, the fact that I have an I there says, yes, they're out of phase. Now, if they're out of phase, they could be circularly polarized. And what would circularly polarized be? The amplitudes would be the same, and they'd just be 90 degrees out of phase. Are those 90 degrees out of phase? How about maybe? <laughs> there, there might be one particular frequency for which you know, this all becomes one. But in general, there, uh, so let's say in general then, uh, the magnitude of EX tilde over EY tilde does not equal one, but EX tilde comma EY tilde 
are out of phase. I.e., uh, there is a an imaginary part. And so what this then shows us is that the, in general, these are elliptically polarized waves. And this was the so-called extraordinary mode. It was the mode propagating perpendicular to the magnetic field, but um, uh, with the electric field vector also perpendicular to the uh, magnetic field. Okay, now, so now we need to go back to this um, um, extraordinary wave. And what we need to do is to now consider um, this, the dispersion relation that we would get from this. And how do we get a dispersion relation? And we take the determinant and set it equal to zero. Those would be the normal modes of the plasma. So, uh, I'm sorry, this needs to be a seven. <laughs> So uh, let's call it a dispersion relation. So extra ordinary, extra meaning not ordinary, of course, uh, mode dispersion relation. And it's from setting the 2 by 2 determinant to 0. And this was that uh, 2 by 2 determinant. So uh, what you end up with then is, uh, let's say, epsilon hat, epsilon xx times epsilon yy minus k squared c squared over omega squared. So that's the diagonal. And then minus epsilon xy epsilon yx equals 0. Um, now, what were all these things? Uh, and again, we're considering electrons only. Um, well, there's a lot of. Um, So what we end up with then is, uh, leaving out the epsilon naughts, uh, 1 minus omega p squared over frequency squared minus um, cyclotron frequency squared. So that's the uh, epsilon xx. And then the next part is this epsilon yy, which is a 1 minus omega p squared over omega squared minus cyclotron frequency squared. But then we have minus um, k squared c squared over omega squared. And then we have this uh, last term, okay, which is this epsilon yx, uh, epsilon xy and epsilon yx. And that is just i omega p squared omega c over omega times omega, or divided by omega squared minus omega c squared. That's the epsilon xy. Then the other one just is the same thing, but has a imaginary part chain, the sign changed. Omega c over omega, omega squared minus omega c squared. And more or less, this is just a nice demonstration of how ugly some of these dispersion relations can get to be. Okay. Now, uh, the, we have um, here, okay, minus and minus goes to plus, but the i squared gives us a minus 1. So we can take uh, all of this over to the right-hand side. And um, let's do a little bit of manipulation. Um, I think it's best to just point out, I guess is the best word I should say at this point, that I can solve it for k squared c squared over omega squared. I can write all of this in terms of that, right? And let me just uh, uh, 
shortcut all that and tell you what the answer is. Namely, it's k squared c squared over omega squared, which is what we often call the index of refraction squared, which is equal to c squared over the phase velocity squared. Um, and it turns out, if you just manipulate all this through, this becomes 1 minus omega p squared times omega squared minus omega p squared divided by omega squared times omega squared minus omega hybrid squared, where omega hybrid squared is the upper hybrid frequency we had before, namely omega p squared plus omega c squared. Now, uh, so th this is our general extraordinary mode uh, dispersion relation. Okay, written is the form. This is you know k squared of omega. So you tell me the omega, and I'll tell you the k uh, that it propagates with in the plasma. Now, there's some particularly interesting points at which this dispersion relation in the form of k squared is equal to a function of omega has some interesting properties. And those interesting properties are basically that k can be zero. You know, you can imagine some frequency for which k is going to make all this zero, for which this whole right-hand side is going to be equal to zero. And there's an additional point where omega is equal to omega upper hybrid frequency at which k is going to be infinite. Right, and so that point is going to be called a a, um, a resonance. So let's uh, a little bit talk about that. So um, special points, let's, uh, special values. So for k goes. Remember, this is a, a dispersion relation for k. For those values where k. Uh, Actually, it's k squared, where k squared becomes less than zero. Um, this would be what we would call a cutoff. And why do we call it a cutoff? It's because k is imaginary there. Okay, what that sort of means is, if I was propagating through a medium and the density and magnetic field were changing very slowly compared to the wavelength, this would mean that I'd have a wave going along, and then at some point k squared becomes negative, and that means that it becomes, you know, k becomes imaginary, or alternatively, my wave damps out, okay? So, um, so this is the k squared less than zero range, and it says my wave damps out. On the other hand, I could have, the other case I could have is that k squared goes to infinity, and that's called a resonance. And what does the wave do then? Well, let's suppose there's a point here where k squared is going to go to infinity. My wave sort of comes along, and as k gets closer to that point, okay, k is going to infinity, the wavelength's getting shorter and shorter and shorter, right? So, you know, it's getting, can't quite make it, so to speak. Namely, what's happening is that the wave, wavelength is going, sorry, to zero. So the basic idea is we'll want to examine this dispersion relation for where its special values of cutoff and resonance are, and, and those will uh, assume some significance, let's just say, uh, when we try to analyze this dispersion relation, uh, which we'll do in, in a minute here.